Well, hi there, food friends. It's Kevin, and welcome to Cavalcade of Food. And I'll always say, welcome to Always Analog, where we celebrate the beauty of analog technology in the digital world. So some of you may have thought, starting to watch this video, that you were either watching the right thing or the wrong thing, because today, I'm sort of combining my two channels, Cavalcade of Food and Always Analog. So, Always Analog always starts with me with pen or pencil in hand at my desk writing out the name of the episode. Cavalcade of Food always starts, generally, with me at the chalkboard with chalk in hand, writing out the name of the episode. Why do I do that? Well, why do I do anything? <laughs> but really, it's because, one, I love the craft of writing things by hand. The skill, the craft, the analog way of communicating with something in your hand. Add cursive writing to that mix and it's a home run. I saw a long time ago the decline of cursive as a means of communication and expression and it bothered me. I'm someone who still thinks handwriting is important. Heaven forbid the grid goes down one day. Will we be able to write? Will we be able to use our brain, our muscles, our hands to actually communicate? I don't know. Probably won't happen in my lifetime, but we're no longer really teaching cursive uh, in a lot of school districts. And the only cursive that anyone really needs to have is their signature. But my other issue is, is when you stop writing in cursive, you lose the ability to read in cursive. And there are a lot of very important documents and things that have been written in the history of humanity in cursive. And I think it would be nice to be able to read them in their original form. Yes, I know. Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, all this stuff has been transcribed and you can just Google it and read it on a screen. It's really cool to be able to see the original document and read it. Corporations now who have corporate logos that were in cursive are gradually changing them to printed letters because they're worried that people won't be able to read their logo. Anyways, I'm not going to go on a tirade. Welcome! But this is why I always open my episodes, whether it be Cavalcade of Food or Always Analog, in cursive. And the reason for the combined episode comes back a little bit to education because we're getting close to field trip season and I'm preparing the old cavalcade here for some visits from our local second graders coming on a field trip. Totally thrilled and they've come before so it's not the first time but it's so fun to see these kids in here. And as you can know, there's a lot to look at. Uh, but one of the highlights of their field trip and the last stop is the typewriter room. So my job between now and the arrival of the, the students is to make sure all the typewriters have 
fresh ribbons and are working properly because you know these are seven-year-olds and seven-year-olds love to touch things well we all do sometimes we love to to pick things up and look at them but because of the nature of the collection they have to touch with their eyes until we get to the typewriter room and they can lay their hands on a typewriter and actually experience using one and some of the students have never even seen one before let alone used one so it's exciting so since I'm going through the typewriters I thought oh I'll do a typewriter review for Always Analog, which is something that I do probably not as frequently as I would like or I should on Always Analog, but I do from time to time kind of review or take a closer look at one of the typewriters that I have. Uh, and I'm going to do that today. So I'm not going to show the typewriter review on Cavalcade of Food. What I will do is ask you to check the typewriter out on Always Analog, where it will be posted there. And for those of you on Always Analog, you'll get to see a little bit of the cavalcade before the typewriter review. So that's how I'm putting the two together. Okay, here we go. Okay, I thought I would start with sort of a bird's eye view of the cavalcade and the route that the students take on their field trip. So I'm standing a little bit in front of the front door and we will come in and we are gonna go back to, it's hard to see, make it from here. And this camera doesn't have a zoom, but um, in the left corner is the kitchen. Those of you who watch Cavalcade of Food will see the jello molds there uh, in that corner and know that that's where the kitchen is. And we'll start there. So you have the kitchen and then um, next to the kitchen is the cookbook library where uh, Often we're doing these cookbook videos, which I know many people enjoy those. And then we come over here, and this is the record library and phonograph department. And along the walls, we have coffee pots and blenders going right down the line uh, into the cookbook library. Over there on the wall, that is sort of a display of artifacts from the Ben Franklin dime store, which is what this building was for over 80 years. It was the Pabst Ben Franklin store. And there were a number of things left here, and the Paps family gave me um, a number of things. And I always like people to remember that this was a dime store. Um, and so, anyways, that's right there. And again, you see the records. Uh, these are the records that I produced the Cavalcade radio show with. Um, and then cookbook library, kitchen. Here's the main hall. So um, we have mostly dishes going down the hall on the left and a little bit on the right. Then we get into some small appliances. We'll take a closer look. And then, uh, let's see. Whoop, I guess you don't want to see the ceiling, do you? How about if we... <laughs> How about if we come down a little bit here? And in that corner, perhaps through the through some of the lamps, you'll see the range room. 
and that's where I keep the, my stove collection and the refrigerators are behind that. Then along the wall here I have my collection of radios and then the last stop on the tour is the typewriter room uh, which is right here. So we'll take a closer look ground level but I just wanted to sort of give you a bird's eye view. People have asked me sort of about the cavalcade and how it's laid out. So here it is. So we'll go through the record library here and make note of the blenders and the coffee pots. And now we're walking into the library. Um, got a collection of recipe boxes. Who remembers those? Anyways, more blenders, more coffee pots. Here the cookbook library. People are often asking about what's on the top shelf. Thermoses, ice buckets, cookie jars. Oh, potato chip tins, canister sets. I've done videos on a lot of these things. Uh, if you haven't seen them and are interested, please just search Cavalcade of Food. I'm going to come out to the main aisle here. I did an episode on glass, uh, pitchers, some of you may recall. Again, dishes canister sets on this side, cake carriers, waffle irons, crock pots, we got down there, electric griddles, cookers, fryers, food processors, coffee mills, Toasters, irons, more coffee pots, teapots. Of course, here's the kitchen, familiar to many of you. The electric skillets. I get more questions about electric skillets, I think, than anything else. Then we come into the range room. Got a few refrigerators here. I only have about seven or eight. Um, I have a greater interest in in, in electric ranges as, as those of you who watch know. Roasters, Tupperware. I'm going to say hi to Madge. My desk, mixers, can openers. A few things from my my first ten years of working life, age eighteen to twenty eight or so. I was a motion picture projectionist a job that doesn't even exist much any, at all anymore. Everything's digital. This takes us back out to the main aisle. Oh, look at 
This is the Cavalcade of Cavalcades. Cavalcade of Stars, Comic Cavalcade. Cavalcade of Song Hits. Cavalcade of Dance, Country Cavalcade. Big Band Cavalcade. Cougat Cavalcade. Country Western Cavalcade. You know, cavalcade is a word that, especially the younger ones, they don't know that word. And they ask how I made it up. And so it's like, no, it's actually a real word. And it's not used as much as it was. Uh, but this shows them that I'm just not making it up here. We're always teaching, always learning, right, folks? Okay, so my always analog friends, here's the typewriter room. So I've kind of got it divided up here. These are standard typewriters starting here, what some call desk typewriters standard size. Uh, I've got a lot of telephones and other, there's a dictaphone, other analog equipment sort of mixed in here in the room. Um, so these are, again, all sort of standard desk typewriters. And then, as you can see, I have, these are my portables here. And we have a few stations. And so the students come in one class at a time, which is about 22, 24 students. And so each student gets their own machine, their own typewriter to type on. And they can, we put a piece of paper in here and uh, they can go to town and it's just amazing to see when they finally figure out how these things work, um, how excited they are. I've also got some adding machines and cantometers here as well, since we're in the analog department. Here's an analog. <laughs> contacts which we have in our phone now but this is the analog version the old rolodex so many of you will remember these things there's some stand mixers and more coffee pots these are typing books from schools uh, as well as some recordings and other uh, tapes, things where you could learn typing um, on your own. But these are, these are typing textbooks, and we use these in school. I certainly did. I've also got some Greg Shorthand books. Talk about another incredible skill um, that is now completely obsolete, and it's too bad. Shorthand, amazing, amazing work. And then I remind the students that when we type things out, we didn't have spell check. And we had we used a dictionary. So I have a collection of dictionaries here too and some of the source. Um, here's a old typewriting certificate. Here's a record, touch typing. This gentleman here, uh, Albert, uh, I don't remember his last name, was the world's champion typist in 1928. Could type faster and mo more accurately than anybody else. 
here is a record where you would practice your shorthand dictating business letters. And of course, the touch typing chart, which fingers used wit keys. There's another touch type record album to help us learn. Uh, again, portables and Here's one of our typing books. Who remembers this? Uh, I think I might feature the Olympia SG-1 on today's Always Analog. I have a couple of them one here and one over there in the corner and they are our favorite typewriter amongst many typists uh, even of current day so anyways and then we come out here and we're right back where we started So uh, for those of you who are cavalcade of food watchers, that sort of wraps things up for this episode. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get ready for the typewriter review. Again, that, go over to Always Analog if you're interested in seeing that. If you have any interest in pencils, pens, writing, handwriting, uh, typewriters, and the like, uh, that's always analog. I will say I do more pencil reviews than anything else. And I could go into a big thing about the significance of the pencil and how it has um, changed the world in so many ways, the humble pencil, but I won't do that here. But if you'd like more of that, go to Always Analog. Uh, you can also go to the website cavalcadeoffood.com and on the home page you'll find a link to the Always Analog channel and you can see um, all the stuff that I'm doing there as well. So uh, for Cavalcade of Food everybody, Thanks for joining me on this tour and combined with our friends from Always Analog. And for Always Analog, you just stay tuned because we're going to take a look at a typewriter coming up next. Let's take a look at this Olympia SG-1. So the SG-1 was Olympia's full size typewriter. This SG-1 series was made from the late 50s until the early 60s. And uh, I believe this typewriter dates per the serial number uh, 1958. If you uh, have a typewriter uh, if you find the serial number of the typewriter, every typewriter should have one. You can go to the typewriter database, which is an incredible resource for all things typewriter uh, and typewriter collectors, and put the serial and by the serial number and manufacturer or brand of your machine, you should be able to get a manufacturing date, or a year at least, at least a year. So um, anyways, this machine was made in West Germany, back when there was a West Germany and an East Germany. And those of us of a certain age remember when Germany was two separate countries. So these were made in West Germany and of course Olympia made 
uh, standard full-size typewriters like the SG-1. They also made portable typewriters. And a lot of people consider these to be among the best typewriters out there. Uh, I have a number of them, and I think they are very fine machines indeed. So uh, let's take a closer look at this SG-1. Um, I'm going to come in, and first let's just sort of look at the shape of it. Here's a side view. Now an interesting feature, you see that turn knob right there. Um, the SG-1s had interchangeable carriages. So this entire carriage comes off. You loosen, there's one of those on either side here and you loosen it and the whole carriage lifts out and you could put on a different size carriage. Uh, they, they made them quite large. So depending on the application you were using your typewriter for, um, if you were doing ledger sheets or other things, you could put a monstrous carriage on here. Uh, and then you could put, this is the standard carriage here for just um, regular, you know, correspondence use. Although this typewriter does have a particularly uh, interesting font. We'll get to that in a bit. So if we look at the front of the keyboard, I think we won't see anything necessarily too strange. Remember, this is a... Um, a machine not made in the United States, although it was manufactured for um, an American market. But it has some really great buttons here. Uh, it doesn't have a one. So uh, we see that, of course, a lot in older typewriters, where the, the numeral keys start with two. This one has a plus and an equals. Um, it also has on this side a exclamation point which is sometimes missing uh, on these uh, machines and a three-quarter. Down below you'll see it also has a degree sign as in 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 36 degrees Celsius or whatever, and it also has a, a th, th, the 13th, the 12th, uh, the 11th. It doesn't have an nd, but it has a th. Uh, you have a fraction keys here, one quarter, one half, uh, and then if you have odd fractions, you have a one diagonal. So you could do a one-third, a one-eighth by pressing this key and then hitting a three. So that's sort of interesting. Um, here you have a shift key. They mark it SL for shift lock. SL, shift lock. MR is your margin release key. When you hit the margin and you know, need to go beyond either your left margin or your right margin. Uh, this is your backspace. This will move the carriage back. This is an interesting feature on these uh, SGs uh, that Olympia had. This is for um, spaced typing. So you could put a half space in between letters by pressing that down, like so. Um, and that was used sometimes when making a correction. Uh, you would need to have a little extra space uh, when you're putting your corrected letters in. And so you could, you could do that. Uh, it kind of helped you to squeeze in 
some letters. Other than that, the keyboard is fairly standard. This is your touch control, your sensitivity. So a lot of typewriters had these and sometimes they were under the hood, uh, sometimes they were up front, but Olympia has this right up here. Uh, one being the lightest touch and you could go up to seven, eight, eight. Eight being you, if you wanted to put the firmest touch on it. So, and then it had a kind of an interesting mechanism for your ribbon. Now, note that I have just a solid black ribbon, and that's generally what I put in the typewriters. Sometimes I have a black and a red ribbon, but, but they're generally all just one color. So here you have, um, it's not black, but the blue is for the black, uh, and it's basically uh, hitting the um, bottom of the ribbon. Okay, and um, then if you had a bicolored ribbon, you could hit, turn it to red, and red would hit the top and then it has a yellow yellow the um, uh, the slugs hit the center of the ribbon so if you had a if you had a black and red ribbon and you had this on the yellow setting it would be kind of half and half half red half black but if you were using a single color ribbon as I do, it helped you get the most use out of the ribbon. So it allowed you to get into the middle of that ribbon where there still might be a good ink supply. And then it had white, which of course is for stenciling, um, for cutting ditto mimeograph masters. And then we go back to blue. So that's just sort of interesting. Let's see, what else do I want to show you? Uh, here on the side, this is your carriage release right here. This little gizmo here is to clear your tabs. Um, let's see, if you, if you push this out, this allows for variable line spacing okay by pu pulling out on the left platen knob um, you'll have your variable line spacing control there up here let me see if we can get in here with the camera this is your line spacing option here one two and a half one, one and a half, two, two and a half. And then that will correspond here with your arm. Now, a lot of these originally came with a plastic paper support that came up here. You'll see the hinges for it is sticking up right there. That is often missing on these because they were plastic and they cracked and they got brittle. And um, I do have, I think I might have one or two that have them still, but often I find these without that. Here is your margin settings, left margin, right margin, very easy. Simply depress and set. Your scale is in the back there. Could not be easier, very nice. Uh, you'll notice that uh, one thing I like here is it has, uh, on the paper bale, it has metal rollers, not rubber rollers. Uh, and it's nice now that these uh, typewriters are all 65, 70 years old or whatever, um, you know, and you have so many brittle rubber parts uh, on a lot of these machines. But these are made out of metal. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about that. Let's see, let's come over here. This 
is your um, is that your ratchet release? No, this is your ratchet release right here. That releases the ratchet. This is your paper release right here. And then on this side, you have another carriage release and another, whoop, let me, sorry. This is really, and then you have another tab release. Now, we'll talk about this. That is your automatic paper feeder, which is a nice feature on these. Um, and I guess I can show that right now if I can. Basically, what we'll do is we'll put our paper here. Then we will simply whoop, doing this one-handed, but, and you can set this. So if you had, um, you can adjust how far the platen pulls the paper through. And so if you had, uh, you know, corporate letterhead that you were using umpteen times a day, you could set it so that when you, when you put the paper in the feed and you pull, it pulls it right up to the line in which you're going to start typing um, on the letterhead. So that's really nice. Okay, I'm going to get the tripod so that I can use two hands and we'll just sort of pop under the hood here and show you the inside. Do a little typing on here, but first let's look under the hood. So on the SG-1 uh, right here is where you put your thumbs and you just press up and pull out and that reveals the inside here we'll get a little closer look at what we've got going on so uh, you can see that the interior of this typewriter is pretty complex. Again, it has the removable carriage, which is a really interesting feature. I think, too, I want to point out that almost every Olympia that I have seen, whether it be a standard or a portable, is a deluxe. Now, I don't know if they made something other than a deluxe or if you could get, they made a cheaper one that wasn't deluxe, and I will ask any of the uh, typewriter aficionados who watch to comment below with that. But this is a deluxe, as it seems most of the Olympias are. But uh, let me see, I'll try to hear you have also a 7 comma 6. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I cannot recall what that actually refers to, uh, what that is. So, uh, again, something that uh, if anyone can shed some light on that, that would be great. The <laughs> I've got two different uh, ribbon spools on here. One, an old <laughs> rusty metal one, and then one a plastic one. Uh, and I see I've got a couple of type slugs here that have got a little, i got to clean those. they got a little bit of rust on them. The rest look okay. Um, uh, I've seen a number of these SG-1s that have a little rust on the type slug for whatever reason. Uh, so, but, um, there is the, there it is. So let's do this. Let me put in a piece of paper here. And we will use our paper advance. And let me straighten this out a little bit. There we go. Okay, 
Uh, now I'm going to try to type around the tripod and so please bear with me and uh, we will do the best we can here. So there's an example of the bulletin um, font on this typewriter. You can see it's fairly large uh, and uh, it's bold, uh, certainly something that is easily readable and again I don't know there was a specific application for this. Um, but. Whoever used it wanted it with this font on there. I'll zoom back a little bit so that maybe we can see a little bit more of the typing action. change it up a little bit. I think you can see the advancement mechanism here for the ribbon. And it looks like this one will, might need a, a little bit of a fresher ribbon put in, um, but it's looking a little faded, might have a little bit of life in it. I can, let's see if I go to the yellow position. Oh, that's better, isn't it? So there's an example of how this makes allowances uh, to, you can see, to get the most out of your ribbon uh, typing at the, here in the yellow position. You can see we're striking in the middle. And then if we go to the blue position, we're striking at the top. So, um, red position, it lifts the ribbon all the way up and you're essentially hitting it at the bottom. So you could, depending on how you had it set, you know, you could really get the most out of that, that ribbon. Um, but I appreciate you watching and I hope you enjoyed the look, a look at this Olympia SG1 1958 and uh, it is a great machine and I know the, the kiddos will get a, a, a someone will be assigned to that typewriter and they'll enjoy using it and so anyways there it is so uh, Thank you for spending some time. Please share, like, most of all, subscribe if you like what I do here on Always Analog. It does help the channel. And I just appreciate your time. And we'll see you again real soon, right back here on Always Analog.